This is the seventh video in a series devoted to differential equations. In the first six videos, we looked at the basics of differential equations and solving a variety of families of first order differential equations. And today we'll look at the case of when a first order differential equation does not have a nice or does not have an analytic solution. And so if it doesn't have this sort of analytic solution or nice solution, which is what I'll call it, then we need to find some numeric approximation. And in fact, it's kind of a well-known fact, I should say, that many important differential equations do not have nice solutions. And that really underscores our need to coming up with a method for numerically approximating this solution. In fact, many people that work in mathematical modeling, their main purpose is to think about some sort of physical situation and write down the differential equation for that physical situation. And then you you actually form some numerical approximation for the solution because maybe there is not an analytic solution. So I'm really oversimplifying things here, but I'm trying to underscore the fact that it's very important to have approximations for solutions to differential equations. Okay, so let's say we're given the following data. So we have a first order differential equation. We have y prime as a function of x and y. And we also have an initial condition. So we have y evaluated at x naught is equal to y naught. So of course, we need some sort of initial condition to find um, a numerical approximation because we have to have numbers in, into this situation. We can't have some sort of numerical approximation of a whole infinite family of solutions. Okay, and then given this data, what we'd like to do is approximate the solution, which I'll call y of x, on an interval starting at x naught and ending at b. And here I've written it as b is to the right of x naught, but we could actually approximate backwards as well. Okay, so in my picture that I have up here, this blue curve would be our solution y of x. So of course that would be if we could find an exact solution. But what if we can't find an exact solution and we wanna do some sort of approximation? Well, here's the general strategy laid out as a picture which we'll write down into an algorithm. So what we'll do is split the interval from x naught to b into n parts. So just for the sake of simplicity here, I'll break it into four parts. So let's see, that would be right in the middle. This would be in the middle of the middle and the start. Here would be the three quarter spot. And then there we have the end. And then I'll name this X1. I'll name this X2. This is X3. And then this B I'll call X4. And let's notice that we most definitely know that this point that I'm drawing here in pink is on the curve. We know it's on the curve because that's our initial condition which has been given to us. And then our next goal will be to approximate the value of the function at x1. But Again, we don't know what the curve looks like. I've just drawn that here kind of for reference. The only information we know is that y prime equals f of x, y. But notice that y prime is the derivative of the curve or the slope of the tangent line. So we do know the slope of the tangent at x naught, y naught. Okay, so that means we could draw a tangent line going through x naught y naught. So let's maybe draw a tangent line there. And then what we'll do is ride that tangent line until we are over x1. Okay, so we ride that tangent line until we're over x1. So this would be our approximation for the value of our solution at x1. So I would maybe call this y1, and that would be approximately equal to y evaluated at x1. So obviously, given this picture right here, the approximation is quite terrible, but I think you can get the idea of what's going on here. Then what would we do from there? Well, we'd go up here to our point, which is x1, y1, and we would determine the slope of the tangent there. Well, let's say the slope of the tangent there puts us on a tangent line going in this direction. 
and then we would ride that tangent line until we get over x2. So we would write it to here and we would call this y2. So here we've got this is y2, which is approximately equal to y evaluated at x2. And then we would continue this. So we know the slope of the tangent at x2, y2, because that's given by our differential equation. So we would ride that. So we would draw a tangent line there. And we would ride that tangent line until we're over x3. So maybe that's about right here. And then we would continue the process. So let's say our next tangent line has a slope like that. We ride that until we're over x4. So we have that point right there. Okay, so I'd like to point out that I did not take these slopes at x1, y1, x2, y2, or x3, y3 to be the same as the slope of the blue line because those slopes might be different as we're off the blue line. Again, like just because we're on the same vertical line doesn't mean the value of y prime is the same. So this is just for instance, if the slope here sends us down and to the right. Okay, so now what we would do is we would view this collection of points, x naught, y naught, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and x4, y4 as some sort of approximation of y of x. Which if you think about it makes sense because y of x is really just the collection of the points x comma y of x. It's just here we have x running over everything on the interval, whereas this is only over parts of the interval. So and then maybe to drive this home, we could connect these dots. So connecting these dots, we would see that our curve is being approximated by this piecewise collection of line segments. So like I said, this doesn't very well approximate our curve, but you could imagine that if you take many, many more sub intervals here, then it would approximate the curve. Okay, so now that we've got the idea, let's like do this in general. So now we're gonna generalize the idea that we saw on the last board into an algorithm. So the first thing that we'll do is split our interval. So let's maybe say the interval from x naught to b into n equal sub intervals. So this is pretty similar to something you might do when you're learning about Riemann integration in like an integral calculus class. So into n equal sub intervals. So let's maybe draw the picture of that. So here we're starting at x naught, and like I said, we're ending at b, and then we'll split this into x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. We have something in the middle, which is like xi minus one, xi, dot, 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 and then this one at the end is xn. So that would be n equal subintervals. And now, since they're equal subintervals, then we can get a real idea for the length of each subinterval as it's just the length of the entire interval divided by n. So let's introduce some notation for that. So let's set h equal to b minus x naught over n. So that means this subinterval right here has length n, this subinterval here has length n, this subinterval here has length n, and in general, this subinterval from xi minus one to xi also has length n. Great, and then that actually gives us a nice formula for x sub i. Let's note that x sub i is equal to x naught plus i times h. So how do you think about that? Well, think about x naught as the starting point and h as the step length. And what you've done is taken i steps from x naught and you've landed on xi and each of those steps has length h. 
Great, so that's our first step. Our second step is to build the approximation for the value of the function at x1, x2, x3. And what I say by the value of the function, I mean the value of the solution. Okay, so we're given the data y prime is equal to f of x, y, and we've got an initial condition right here. So let's recall that we have f of x, y equals y prime, but by the definition of the derivative, that's equal to the limit as delta x goes to zero of y of x plus delta x minus y of x over delta x. So like I said, that's just the limit definition of the derivative. But now this is approximately equal to for small values of h. So let's say here, small h, this difference quotient where we've replaced delta x with h. So this is, like I said, approximately equal to y of x plus h minus y of x over h where h is this object that we've defined above. So maybe I'll put this in a box just so that we have it. Okay, but now let's look at what we've got. We can look here at this f of x, y, and then here at y of x plus h minus y of x over h, and note that we can easily solve for y of x plus h. And if we do that, we get y of x plus h is approximately equal to y of x plus h times f of x, y. So that may not seem super helpful, but notice what it does. It allows us to find the value of y at x plus something small in terms of the value of y at x plus something having to do with the derivative, which we know is equal to this function right here. Now we'll use the fact that x of i plus one is equal to xi plus h, and that gives us the following formula. So we have y x i plus one is approximately equal to y x i plus h f x i y evaluated at x i. Here I've put the dependence of y on x back into this equation because we'll kind of need that for where we're going. Okay, so just to reiterate what we've got here. So notice we know y of x naught equals y naught, and that'll allow us to approximate y of x1, just entering i equals zero into this equation. And then we can compound that over and over and over again and approximate the value of our solution at all of these points. Okay, so let's see that. So this is where we left ourselves off. The ability to approximate the value of our function at x i plus one in terms of the value of our function at x i. And that motivates the following iterative definition. And so here I'll call this y i plus one is equal to y sub i plus h f of x sub i y sub i. And this is gonna be true for all i between zero and n minus one. And so what this gives us is an approximation for, well, our goal approximation, which was the value of our solution at all of those points xi. And in fact, what we have is y evaluated at xi is approximately equal to y sub i. So we've just done this rule over and over and over again. The approximate equal to changed to an equal to because we're defining these points y sub i, which themselves are meant to approximate the value of our function. Okay, so now let's kind of see how this goes, maybe in order. So we start off knowing the following thing. Y evaluated at X naught is Y naught. That's our initial condition. And you might say, well, how would we find that? Well, maybe if we're a scientist, we would find that by taking some data or something. Okay, and then from there, we can calculate all of the other values of y sub i. So in other words, we have y sub one is equal to y naught plus h f of x naught y naught. Great, and what this gives us is an approximation for 
y evaluated at x1. So we're calling that y sub 1. And then we can do it again, and we'll get y2 is equal to y1 plus h f of x1 y1. And what this gives us, y2 is an approximation for y evaluated at x2. And then next, we would have y3 is equal to y2 plus h f of x2 y2. And what that's giving us is y3 is an approximation of y evaluated at x3. Great. And then, well, where is this ending? Well, this is ending at like our decided upon ending point, which is B, in other words, X sub N. And here we have Y sub N is equal to Y sub N minus one plus H F of X sub N minus one, Y sub N minus one. And what we have here is approximately equal to Y evaluated at X sub N, which itself is Y of B. So this gives us a list of points. So let's maybe put that here. So what we have now is some list of points, x, i, y, i, where i goes between zero and n, and this list of points is approximating our solution. So obviously, since this has a very algorithmic iterative feel, the classic way to do this would be inside a computer, and we'll do that at the end. But before we do that, we'll do a couple of like hand examples just to get an idea for how this works. So for our first example, we'll consider the differential equation y prime equals x plus y. So of course, this is a first order linear differential equation. We could find an exact solution to this. And we will at the end just to check this against our approximation. But for the purposes of working out the approximation, I think this is a good example. And what we'll do is approximate y of 1 given y of 0 equals 1 using four subintervals. So notice we're working from x equals 0 to x equals 1. Those are our two inputs at either end. Using four subintervals, that means our h, the length of our subinterval is 1 quarter. So it's important to keep that in mind. Furthermore, we could notice that in the language that we had before, x0 will be equal to 0, x1 is quarter, x2 is 2 quarters, which is half, x3 is 3 quarters, and finally x4 is 4 quarters, which is 1. So what we'd like to do is approximate y evaluated at x4, which means our goal is to calculate y sub 4, and that will serve as our approximation. Okay, so let's get to it. So we'll first calculate y sub 1, which is equal to, well, let's write all of the details out first. So it's y sub 0 plus h times f evaluated at x 0, y 0. So y 0 is equal to 1, that's given, plus h is a quarter, and then we have f evaluated at x 0, y0. But let's notice that by the structure of our differential equation here, our function f of xy is equal to x plus y. So whenever we do that evaluation, we keep that in mind. So evaluated at x0, y0, well, let's recall that that's being evaluated at 0, 1. By our initial condition, we see that that's just 0 plus 1, so we get 5 fourths for y sub 1. And then in terms of our approximation, that means that y evaluated at a quarter is approximately equal to 5 fourths. Okay, now let's calculate y sub 2. Maybe we won't go through all of the details as before, but it'll be y sub 1, which was 5 quarters as defined before plus h, so h is 1 quarter, and then we have f evaluated at 1 quarter 5 quarters. So 1 quarter plus 5 quarters is equal to 6 quarters, which is 3 over 2. But now adding this together, we have 5 fourths plus 3 eighths. That gives us 13 over 8. But that means we've got our approximation for y evaluated at a half. So we have y evaluated at a half is approximately equal to 13 over 8. And now we can continue on. So y evaluated at 3. So that'll be equal to y evaluated at 2. So that's 13 over 8 plus h 
times our function evaluated at x2, y2. So that's going to be 1 half plus 13 eighths. Again, that's because of our function up here. Okay, so now doing this calculation, which is not so bad, you get 69 over 32. And that's so, so that's for y of 3. So that means y of 3 quarters is approximately equal to 69 over 32. Great. Now we've got one last step. So y sub 4 is equal to y sub 3, which was 69 over 32, plus h, which is a quarter. And then we have f evaluated at x3, y3. So that's going to be 3 quarters plus 69 over 32. And again, that's an arithmetic problem, and you can calculate it to be equal to 369 over 128. Great. And so that gives us our final approximation. And so our final approximation here, y of 1 is approximately equal to 369 over 128, which is about 2.882. Nice. So again, since, the, since this is a first order linear differential equation, we can actually find an exact solution for this. And we won't work out the exact solution. Look a couple videos ago and you'll see how to find an exact solution to a first order linear differential equation. But what we'll end up with is y is equal to 2e to the x minus x minus 1. So that's our exact solution. So let's maybe put here, this is the exact solution. And now if we evaluate that at 1, well, we're going to get 2e minus 2, but that is approximately equal to 3.44. 3.44. So you can see our error is a little bit more than a half. That's the distance between 2.88 to 3.44. So the error here, I would say, is quite large. But that being said, we did use a pretty large h value of one quarter. So taking that into consideration, I think this approximation is actually pretty good. Okay, so now let's get rid of this and we'll look at a broader description of this type of approximation as well as a second approximation. So now that we've gone over our first method for approximating numerical solutions to differential equations, and that first method is called Euler's method. I don't think we said that out loud, but just to be fair, we'll call that Euler's method. Here I've got a blueprint for more approximations. And these are maybe so-called order two approximations, whereas Euler's method was an order one approximation. And we'll like kind of see why. So the main idea is the next value in our approximation is equal to the previous value plus the step size times the slope of the tangent. And this allows us to build every value from the initial condition by, like we described earlier, riding along the tangent line. And whatever we take as an approximation for the slope of the tangent is what distinguish, distinguishes these approximation techniques. And I should say that here we're approximating the slope of the tangent. And that's because the slope of the ta tangent depends on this function x, which depends on what y you plug into it. Okay, so last time we just took the slope of the tangent to be what's happening at xi, yi, but a more general way to do it is to take the approximation for the slope of the tangent to be some sort of weighted mean of what's happening at xi, yi, and then what's happening some point between xi, yi, and xi plus 1, yi plus 1. Okay, so how do we get a point between xi and xi plus 1? Well, we scale it by h over 2 rho. And now let's notice that if rho equals a half, well, let's point that out real quick. So if rho equals 1 half, then this xi plus h over 2 rho turns into xi plus h. That's because the half and the rho will cancel, but that's exactly xi plus 1. So that means we're taking some sort of weighted mean of what's happening with the defining function for our differential equation between xi and xi plus 1. 
Okay, so what kind of weighted mean will we take here? Well, we'll take this to be equal to the following. One minus rho times f evaluated at x i y i. So that'll be the weighting that we put on f. And then plus rho times f evaluated at this next point. So we've got x i plus h over two rho, and then y i, and then y evaluated at x i plus h over two rho. So we'll take that to be the slope of the tangent. But look, that's a little bit problematic because during our system of doing these approximations, we'll have an approximation for y evaluated at xi, but not past xi. But this is using something that's happening past xi. So we'll in fact need to use an approximation within this approximation, but we'll just use the standard Euler's method for that approximation that's happening inside of the green box. And so that means this can be approximated by yi plus h over 2 rho times f of xi yi. So that's our approximation within our approximation. So that's why it's called a second order approximation, because we're like composing these approximations with each other. Okay, so now that we've got this kind of blueprint happening for these second order approximations, let's maybe summarize them at the top of the next board and look at some special cases before we move into Mathematica for some, some examples. Okay, so based off the blueprint we saw on the last board, we can have this general second order approximation of our solution to our differential equation y prime equals f of x y and then y of x naught equals y naught. And it goes like this. So we've got y of i plus 1 is y of i plus h times, remember this was a weighted average or a weighted mean. And so here we're taking rho between 0 and 1 and we've got 1 minus rho times f of x i y i. And then we've got rho times f evaluated at x i plus h over 2 rho. And then that embedded approximation of y evaluated at that x. So in other words, y i plus h over 2 rho f of x i y i. And so just to point out, this is our first order approximation of y inside of this whole thing here. You might say this is problematic because I, I said here that rho could be inclusively between 0 and 1. What happens if it's 0 here and we get zeros in the denominator? Well, we read these zeros in the denominator. Well, we don't really pay attention to them. We take this 0, which is multiplying outside, and have it just cancel this entire term down. And that gives us the four spe or that gives us the first of the four special cases that we'll talk about. So if rho is equal to zero, then this whole second term collapses, and this one minus rho just turns into one, and we're left with our standard Euler's method, which we developed earlier in the video and we did some examples on, or we did an example on. Then if rho is equal to one half, then notice this gives us a half right here, a half right here, and then this is xi plus 1 as we discussed, and then that is the Euler's method approximation of yi plus 1, and that's called the modified Euler's method. And then if rho is equal to 3 quarters, you get something called Hune's method, and finally if rho is equal to 1, you get something called the midpoint method. Like I said, this is like a nice general second order approximation where you can fiddle with rho to find out which one gives you the best approximation given a certain differential equation. And you might say, well, what about third order approximations or fourth order approximations? Well, as you could guess, third, fourth, fifth, etc. order approximations will take weighted means of values of f at different points. So instead of at two points, it would maybe have three points for a third order approximation, four points for a fourth order approximation, and so on and so forth. And in fact, there's a fourth order approximation called the Runge-Kutta approximation. That's like the gold standard for approximating solutions to differential equations. I'm not going to cover it in these videos because I think I'm going to use it as a final project for the course that I'm teaching. 
Okay, so now to finish this video off, we're going to go into Mathematica and we're going to write some code that will do this general second order approximation, test it out a little bit, and then we'll come back with some warm up exercises. Here's a look at a Mathematica notebook that I put together showing how to do Euler's method quickly. And this loop that I've built can easily be edited to do the other methods that we saw in the video. So let's see, let's say we want to approximate a solution to the differential equation y prime equals 3x squared minus y squared, where we have an initial condition of y evaluated at 0 is 1. So here's my setup. So I've got all of these parts in my setup, and then I have my comments over here. So we'll just go through these real quick. So we're going to define our function, capital F, to be 3x squared minus y squared based off of the notation that we used on the chalkboard. Notice I've got underscores here to show that x and y are variables. So next up, we'll define our initial x and y value. So that'll be x0 equals 0 and, x not, and y0 equals 1. Then we'll say our final x value, well let's just say that it's equal to 5 just for the sake of uh, this example. And I've put a decimal point here to force floating point calculations just so that we're not within exact rational numbers. It makes everything work out more quickly. Next we'll use um, 100 steps, so that'll be 100 steps between 0 and 5. So you can calculate the step size on your own, although we'll have Mathematica do that. Now, obviously, since we're in a computer, you can ratchet this up to 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 steps pretty easily. Next, we'll set the step size equal to b minus x naught, so that's the final x value minus the initial value over the number of steps. And then we define this function, xi, to be x0 plus ih, much as we did in our setup on the chalkboard. So notice I've got an underscore here because I'm defining this as a function. Then we'll set our initial condition. So this is y evaluated at 0 equals y0. But this isn't really y evaluated at 0. This is like the 0th step. So you can think about this as y sub 0 in our language before. And then this is the loop that makes it all happen. So this is the loop that we did on the chalkboard. So we've got y of i plus 1 equals y of i plus h f of xi yi. And this is i running from 0 to n minus 1. So up here we define y naught. And then the first part of this loop defines y1. The second defines y2. The third defines y3, and so on and so forth. And notice that there are n times that we go through this. We just start at 0. So the nth defines yn. And then after that, I've defined a table just to be the list of these numbers right here. So the xi comma yi. So this is really our approximation to the solution on the interval 0 to 5. That's what this list is. So now we can just push enter on this and it'll do the calculation pretty quickly. Although if we were to ratchet this up, it would take longer to do the calculation. Then we can compare this maybe to an exact solution. So to find the exact solution, we use the dsolve command. So notice we have dsolve. There's our differential equation. I've changed my dependent variable to z and my independent variable to t just so that it's totally independent of x and y up here. The thing with defining x and y in this loop is that it makes the variables x and y not really work in this dsolve command. Okay, so this is the notation for dsolve. So notice we have a list of equations. Our differential equation comes first. And then second, we've put our initial condition. So this is z of 0 equals 1. Although you could put them in e either order. And then we've got z of t. We're solving for that function. And then t, our independent variable. And as you can see, we get kind of a crazy solution involving uh, Bessel function, the gamma function, and so on and so forth. So what I've done down here is I've taken this solution and set it equal to the function g. So I've got g of t equals z t with this slash dot. That means we replaced z of t with this solution that we've calculated up here. And then I have this double bracket 1 because you notice that we've got a list right here. 
and that's just taking out like the inner part of this list. Okay, so let's maybe make this calculation. So this actually takes a little bit longer. And then here we're saying an equal, we've got it. And now we can compare these. So since this Y list is a list of points, we'll need to use a list plot to plot that. And then we'll use just a normal plot function to plot the function G, which is our exact solution. So I have made my plot style red and thick for the function G, just so that we can see it a little bit more easily. And then we just run this and you see that we get a pretty good approximation. Notice these dots are kind of going all over the place with respect to um, the curve, but they don't differ by very much at all. And if you want to, you can change the order of P1, P2, and that changes which of these is on top, if you will. Another thing we could do is go up and say, well, maybe I'm really interested in just between 2.5 and 3, and we can get a zoomed in view of what's happening. So we can see these individual dots right here versus our exact solution. Next, we can calculate our error at x equals 5. So since we have 100 steps up here, that means the 100th step will be the step when x is equal to 5. So that means we'll need y of the 100th step. But that's just g minus regular 5. So notice our error is like pretty low, so that's cool. And then if we wanted to, this is a, maybe not super worth it, but we could write all of this as a standalone function using Mathematica's built-in module command. So notice I've got this function that I'm calling Euler. So it takes an input of a function, the initial condition, the final value of x, and the number of steps, and it produces a, an approximation. So notice here, this is producing an approximation to the function or to the differential equation y prime equals 2y, where our initial condition is an x value of 0, a y value of 1. And then we have also a final x value of 2 and then 10 steps. So that's why we have 10 points right here. Remember, the approximation is just a list of points. Okay, well, we could do maybe a hundred steps to get something larger and notice it does it quite quickly or we could do a thousand steps to get it to be even larger and it does it still pretty quickly and notice the last term here is two comma 54 and change. But if you were to solve this differential equation exactly, you would clearly get e to the 2x. So that means this number right here at the very end should be about e to the 4. So let's calculate that to see if it is. So if we calculate e to the 4, we see that we have 54.5982. But look, that's, that's a pretty good approximation here. Okay, so now looking back at this loop for Euler's method, how could we easily tweak this to find an approximation for a different differential equation? Well, let's say we want to approximate a solution to the differential equation y prime equals the sine of y. Well, we could just put the sine of y there. Then let's maybe change it here so that we know what's going on. So sine of y. And then let's maybe use the same initial condition of 0, 1. And now let's go up to b equals 3, and let's continue to use 100 steps. So we could run it, and we've made the approximation. But in order to get a feel for what's going on, let's find the exact solution down here. So this would be sine of z of t, just given the fact that we've changed the name of our independent variable. And let's notice we get a little bit of funny business for the solution, but I think it should all work out in the end. So we're going to bring this down again. So we've got sine of t, and we've got our g function defined, and now we can compare the two solutions. So on the interval from 2.5 to 3, notice our approximation is not as good this time but it's maybe not quite as bad as you might think, given that this range over here on the y-axis is not really that great. So let's maybe look at the whole plot from 0 to 3. Recall that in this case, we only need to go from 0 to 3 based off of our final x value. Okay, and as you can see, our approximation is not good this time. And I think it probably has to do with this little issue that we had right here. Okay, so let's finish this off with one more example. So let's 
amend the loop to find a solution for y prime equals y times e to the x where y of 0 is 1. So that means we would go in here to our function and we would define it to be y times e to the x. And then notice we've got our x of 0 is 0, y of 0 is 1. And then let's say our final x value is 2. So we've got b equals 2. And let's use a thousand steps here. Okay, so if we push shift enter on that, we'll make the list. And now let's calculate the exact solution. So if our equation is y prime equals y times e to the x, then here we have z prime equals z times e to the t, based off of our earlier discussion how we need to change the names of the variables. So we check it here to make sure there's a nice solution, and then we define it in the as the function g right here. And now we can compare these by graphing. And then finally, you might want to find the error at x equals 2, which is as far as we went. And that would be the difference between y evaluated at 1,000, that's the thousandth step, and then g evaluated at 2. So notice my error is pretty big here. It's 19.3-ish. So let's see if we can make that smaller by doing 10,000 steps. So let's see, if we do 10,000 steps, then we can look at the two plots. And then notice we have to change this to 10,000, and our error is lower now. It's just a little bit less than 2. So I think that's pretty good. I think that gives evidence that this should have lower error with a more number of steps, which is a pretty clear thing. Like, that would be what you would expect. Okay, so now I'll finish this video up by giving you guys some... Um, warm-up problems to try. One of them will be by hand and the others will be making approximations in a computer. So if you're in my course you should do that in Mathematica and you can most definitely just use this loop and edit it as needed to do our other methods. So here are a couple of warm-up exercises. One to do by hand and one to do in a computer. So the first is to use Euler's method with three steps by hand to approximate y evaluated at 3 if y prime equals x squared minus y squared and y evaluated at 0 is 0. And then the next one is given y prime plus 3y equals 7e to the 4x and y evaluated at 0 is 2, approximate y evaluated at 1 where your step size is 0 0.025 using all four second order methods we talked about. So the Euler's method, modified Euler's method, Hune's method, and the midpoint method. But notice that this is a first order linear differential equation which means we know how to find an exact solution. So finish it off by comparing each of these approximations with the exact solution. And that's a good place to stop.